Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUARFM 89. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. The COVID curve has not flattened, not in Arkansas, not in our region, and in only scattered parts of the country. It's Arkansas's economic curve we'll consider in this edition, recognizing that we're but one part of a whole, and acknowledging as well that the economic, to no small extent, is shaped by the pandemic. Joining us for a look at the near-term dollars and cents of the situation, Dr. John Anderson of the U of A's Division of Agriculture, Mervyn Jabaraj of the University's College of Business, and Tab Townsell, CEO of Metroplan, the Central Arkansas Council of Local Governments. Gentlemen, thanks very much for coming aboard. Let me just begin by asking all of you, uh, we had some... Uh, as we begin this broadcast, we're just savoring the numbers from the Commerce Department. Annualized GDP in the United States as a whole fell by about uh, just under one third. The uh, the second quarter dropped nine and a half, the, the, the biggest on record. What does that bespeak for Arkansas? And Mervyn, we'll start with you. Right. I mean, I think uh, the sh numbers are shocking. Uh, you know, third drop in GDP is unprecedented, and just quarter to quarter, that was about nearly 10 percent, nine and a half percent drop. Um, so, you know, once we get past the idea that this was shocking, um, we've never seen anything like this. Uh, I think we should also say that it was completely expected. We did shut down vast sectors of our economy for a significant period of uh, the time period for which data was collected. Uh, and we were hoping to maybe see some resurgence in the economy in the later parts, uh, you know, mid-May to June. Uh, but while the pandemic might have subsided in some states that saw early uh, outbreaks, uh, they started picking up in other states like here in Arkansas. So uh, while, you know, maybe our economy didn't contract nearly as much in uh, uh, early March, mid-March or April, it certainly started getting hit in later May and in June and where we are today in July. So, uh, you know, outside of the immediate shock of those large numbers, uh, I think it was fully expected that we would see uh, this type of a GDP uh, growth rate. But uh, it's still, uh, you know, something to pay attention to, something to note that we are not past this pandemic. And while no one expects the third quarter GDP results to be nearly as bad as this, if we don't get a handle of the pandemic, yeah. uh, then we won't expect a positive result there. Either. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, the chairman of the Fed said, what, a couple of days ago, Mr. Powell said a couple of days ago, if we don't handle the pandemic, we don't handle the economy. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, what... Uh... What the second quarter numbers show us is the impact that uh, the pandemic uh, is capable of inflicting uh, on an economy. A 30, 33 percent nearly uh, annualized drop quarter to quarter is massive. Uh, it's not something we've seen before. Uh, it is, I think, as, as Mervyn uh, alluded to, at least, it, that is a backward-looking uh, view. That is what happened in the past. And the real question now is how quickly do we recover from that? Uh, if you look for a silver lining in those numbers, I think that it's, uh, uh, you know, largely due to the, the massive transfers that took place in the second quarter. Uh, consumers are sitting on a lot of savings. I mean, the savings rate was, was, was large. Certainly not all consumers are sitting on savings, but in the aggregate, very large savings rate. The fuel for a recovery is there, but unless the pandemic is under control and people have some confidence that they can get out and, and live their lives and engage in the in the, the kind of activities that, that grow the economy, not much is going to happen. Yeah, Tab Townsell, now you obviously you've got a close eye on, on local governments, certainly in the central part of the state, but as a metro, as a metro area, uh, as an urban area, this may mirror, say, Jonesboro and northwest Arkansas as well. What are you seeing, either from the data or anecdotally? Um, number one, from the data, we are seeing the impact of, uh, of the, the shutdowns. Uh, beginning in April, the largest 10 cities in Arkansas, which are primarily concentrated in those metropolitan regions, as you say, with a few outliers, uh, those sales tax numbers from the month uh, get collected in the month of April were down for the 10 largest cities in Arkansas, seven and a half percent. But what we're also seeing is, uh, and this may reflect um, to a degree, some of the, the cushion given by the stimulus packages, 
is those places that do not represent such a regional market city, um, perhaps representative more of the next 20 cities in Arkansas in size, the 11, uh, 11 through uh, 30, uh, those cities weren't down at all. They were very, very slightly up with about as many winners as losers in terms of up and down. So what we're seeing is that if there were needs, they were purchased probably by the, the, the extra shot in the arm the economy got locally with the stimulus packages. Uh, but if there was a question of whether you drive into the regional city to, city to shop in the specialty store, that seemed to have been more dramatically impacted. Well, obviously, the implications for state and local governments uh, uh, from the third quarter, anyway, are pretty, pretty profound. You want to make, uh, you want to look ahead, Tab Townsville, if you can. Well, Can't, is and, that even possible, really? It, you can make some assumptions on some on some some basic ideas. April was the first first month before any loosening of the stay-at-home restrictions were encouraged. Uh, so it would be the most profoundly impacted as we were listening to news out of other parts of the country. Uh, May numbers uh, showed the largest 10 cities were roughly flat. And the next 20 largest cities uh, actually up 13% uh, in their sales tax numbers. Um, moving into June, we can expect perhaps a, a similar number there. But I think that you'll start seeing a downturn in those numbers, in, in local numbers, predicting this, uh, that you'll start seeing that in July as as the, the effects of the resurgence, uh, as bringing the coronavirus impacts more closely to home, and we've seen the numbers in Arkansas rise, I think you'll see that uh, our numbers start curtailing more dramatically uh, in, in, in those months. And if that's the case in outlying months as we get closer to autumn, um, we could see a, a more profound impact. All right. Uh, Mervyn Jabaraj. Yeah, I would add to that that the one reason why we're seeing, you know, the bigger cities have a much more dramatic decline in sales tax collections and smaller cities don't have uh, as much of a decline or even, you know, a small increase in sales tax collections is uh, the spending levels by income. So in Arkansas, if we look at uh, how people are spending compared to where they were spending in January and February, which, to be fair, is not a month for high retail or consumer expenditures, because everybody has a Christmas hangover, uh, low and middle income households are spending more money today than they were spending in January and February, whereas high income households are spending a lot less money today than they were spending in January and February. And the reason for that is twofold. High income households are more likely to be staying and working from home. And a lot of the consumer expenditures that they engage in uh, tend to be around uh, reasons that they engage in consumer spending when they go to work, uh, a wide variety of services that they might use while they're going to work, which they're not doing right now while they're staying at home. Uh, so, you know, I don't have to keep updating my wardrobe while I stay in this uh, room here working for the past three, four months. Uh, whereas lower income households and middle income households are A, more likely to be going to work, and B, uh, a big reason we're seeing an increase in consumer spending at those households, at lower and middle income households, is because of the $600 additional boost to the unemployment insurance, which at the expires at the end of July. So unless Congress, uh, you know, it is going to expire, Congress can't uh, pass a new version of it soon enough to uh, fix the lapse. But a large portion of why low and middle income households are spending more money today than they were in January and February is because a lot of them were using that $600 boost in unemployment insurance, uh, which in many cases led to them making more money uh, off of unemployment uh, than they would have worked. And so that that segment of the economy, uh, spending money, buying goods and services, is what's holding up the economy. It's not the high-income folks. But, uh, Dr. John Anderson, you were talking earlier, I think, before the broadcast about how people are tending to spend on... Uh, rather than a new necktie, it's it's uh, toilet, bathroom tissue, and and uh, staples, kitchen staples. There's a psychological factor at work here. Yeah, I think there has been a shift in in the the level of spending as well as the way people spend money. There's been a, a kind of a retrenchment back to uh, staple items, uh, necessities. 
uh, you know, less travel, obviously, uh, though that sort of spending, I think, has certainly gone down. Uh, you know, I work in the ag sector and food. There's nothing more basic than food, obviously, and uh, uh, spending on groceries. We've we've really been focused on that over the last uh, two or three months, certainly when we're in the kind of the heat of the pandemic. And uh, so, yeah, there has been, I think, a reallocation toward those basic staple kind of items and away from things that are more discretionary. Well, let, let, let's go back to what uh, Dr. Uh, Mervyn Jabaraj, uh, I'm going to give you a PhD. Is that okay? It's easier to say doctor. But anyway, uh, it's, it's honorary, but it's from Barnes University. But there is, uh, back to the $600 on the but we have chaos in Washington. No one disputes it on either side of the aisle. Uh, the $600 is a sticking point for the GOP and, and for the Democrats as well. Uh, and if it expires, at midnight on July thir 31st, what then? What's the impact going to be? That That is going to be a terrible impact, especially for a state like Arkansas. We're going to be one of the harder hit states if uh, that, uh, when that $600 additional boost in unemployment benefits go away. So, uh, you know, Arkansas typically only pays about 45% of your wages that you would have earned at work from unemployment benefits. So everybody that's currently on unemployment, which there are still a lot of people on unemployment because those jobs in several sectors, especially in the leisure and hospitality industry, have not come back and are not likely to come back anytime soon, all of them would be cut back from where they are today, making maybe up to 120% of their former wages down to 45% of their wages. And you're going to see a whole slew of issues, not only are not uh, going to be engaging in consumer spending that they were, uh, they're not going to be able to pay rent, pay utilities, and all of these basic necessities. So some of those problems that we've punted uh, on during this pandemic, because we've been able to pump as much money into these households, all of those problems are going to start anew uh, at the end of this month when that $600 bonus runs out. Dr. Tab Townsell, that, that would be a significant impact. Uh, it's a pretty ominous possibility. I think that's exactly right. And not only just the, the unemployment benefit, but the stimulus checks that went out to all those incomes, you know, from up to 75,000, you know, ranging, uh, petering out at 100,000, all that factors into the, the more stable spending, uh, basic spending, need spending, the staples versus the neckties uh, that we see. And as that's threatened, that has a more dramatic impact throughout our, our cities and their sales tax collections, which is the lifeblood of city and county government finances. Uh, and, and an aid package for state and local governments as well. Absolutely. Up, up in the air. Up in the air. Uh, Dr. Anderson, you were talking earlier that, that of any sector of the Arkansas economy, maybe ag looked in all of its uh, components, looked uh, the, the healthiest, uh, given the situation? Well, we certainly have a, a, a consumer base that uh, that hasn't left us because of the nature of the of the, the product that we put out on the market. But that, I don't think that means that looking ahead, we don't have real concerns. I think today's GDP report is kind of a, a shot across the bow. Uh, for a lot of our major commodities, I think looking ahead, uh, one of our primary fears has been that a general economic slowdown uh, will affect our markets adversely, and uh, certainly we, we we have documentation of a, of a of a huge economic slowdown in the second quarter. If that continues, that will begin to affect our markets adversely, uh, because even though people aren't going to stop consuming food, they can do a lot of things uh, to reduce their their overall level of consumption and the kind of things they 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 consume. It's it's uh, it's hard to get away from buying food, but you can certainly shift to lower value products. Uh, you can shift to, uh, you know, away from a, a boneless, skinless chicken breast to a, uh, to a, to a bone in leg quarter, for instance, and that generates less value in the whole supply chain. And so, uh, it, uh, we're certainly in a much better position than an industry like the hospitality, hospitality industry. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't have real vulnerability to an economic slowdown. And I think moving ahead, that's our primary concern. Well, and it is such a quicksilver situation. I mean, it is so fluid uh, as long as, well, just as commerce 
in Washington reports this this massive uh, reduction in uh, in 2Q GDP. Germany is reporting that it fell its second quarter fell by 10 percent. Now, again, every country's situation it would appear depends on how effectively it controls the virus. Uh, Mervyn Jabaraj. Yeah, so I think we understood that part of the reason why we shut down large sectors of our economy was to try to get a handle on the virus. And so, uh, you know, we have accepted the economic pain, uh, you know, this massive loss, 9.5% quarter to quarter or 33% uh, annualized, as a trade off to control the spread of the virus. What other countries like Germany have done is they've actually controlled the spread of the virus so they can get back to a more normal economy. It's not going to be completely normal. Uh, we're not going to be completely normal till we have a vaccine, but they'll get much closer to that a lot sooner than we are because we have not controlled the virus. So we've traded uh, the economic loss and not gotten anything out of it, whereas some of these other countries have also gotten this economic loss, but they've also controlled the virus spread. Uh, Tab Townsville is pretty sharp uh, appraisal. But few, I, would, I would say, it, go ahead. I, was say, I would say that's that's exactly right. Um, perhaps we were uh, we should have looked at a more measured. Now, granted, this is looking backwards. We should look at a more measured shutdown to start with. And some quarters were not as susceptible uh, than others. And, and those should have been shut down first, leaving the rest of it open. But we didn't know that at the time. We didn't know where we were. But obviously, you know, there was something, a, a bit of cry wolf in our early response in, in our area. Um, and that, I think that's impacted our numbers today, is that we're seeing reports on a daily basis from the governor's news conference. Um, and so we're going to have to relearn again what we learned previously. This time, we might be able to, to approach a softer uh, uh, closing of, of various businesses. I do think the hospitality industry and, and the restaurant industry eating out and those that those reflected in A&P tax numbers are going to be dramatically um, shut down. I have not seen those yet. Um, but yes, until we get a, a grasp on what's going on with the pandemic, uh, we're going to suffer in all this. Arkansas has always been a lag economy. I don't think in this case we're going to be a lag economy. Um, to the degree we've always been, say, in previous economic slowdowns and, and the Great Recession and such. Um, so this has a profound possibility of impacting us in the second half of this year. Uh, uh, Mervyn, though, Tabs, seems to suggest that we got far too little uh, in, in return for opening up on the pace that we did. I know. I, I agree with that. I mean, we, we just... There was not a lot of belief in opening up in many, many, you know, populations in our in our state, in our in our local region. So while we've seen some benefit from the opening up in the in the, the month of May numbers, um, we're still not as robust as what we normally are in our major cities. We're seeing it that people are not getting out and shopping for the neckties. They're they're saving uh, the upper income people. Uh, up, absolutely correct they're not spending like they were they didn't get the economic benefit of the stimulus uh at least not you know in their personal household income so yes we we did shut down effectively across all sectors and the opening up has not been the panacea that everybody's hoped it would be and and now we're looking at the second shutdown or at least some kind of measured shutdown moving forward uh, uh mervin would it be fair to say that we were early on at the state level anyway penny wise pound foolish no, I mean, I think what we needed to do early on was close everything while the virus was likely to spread really fast early on and use that time to test or build the capacity to test and trace effectively. And I think that has been the biggest failure from the government level. You know, the initial stimulus act that they passed, the CARES Act, was actually fairly good. There are some problems with, you know, how small business loans were handled in that. Uh, but that's, you know, there's always going to be some problem. But the biggest failure we've had is we shut down the economy and did not use the time we had to build up testing and tracing capacity. And that is where other countries are now leaving us behind, is they're able to open up their economy. And when they have small outbreaks, they're able to quickly test the people, trace all their contacts, quarantine all those folks, and contain those outbreaks so they can have 
sort of an 80, 90 percent normal economy, whereas we're unable to do that. So we have ridiculously high rates of infection. And as a result, people are not willing to go out. Here in northwest Arkansas, which, you know, is a high income area of the state, there was a survey taken in early May before cases in northwest Arkansas went up. And that survey was conducted by the Arkansas Small Business Technology Development Center at the university. And 70 percent of people said back then that they would not go to restaurants until August. And that was before the cases are as high as they were today. So, you know, until we contain this the leisure and hospitality industry in particular is going to continue to suffer. Uh, John Anderson, let me come back to you because uh, the, the capacity of the Arkansas, the American farmer, uh, production capacity is just just enormous. Uh, we've got good weather, uh, about the right amount of of, uh, of rain. Uh, the export situation looks or looked promising. Is there the prospect that we are once again producing too much? Well, I think that's a big concern, and again, that uh, goes back to the idea of uh, the impact that an economic slowdown could have, not just in this country, but but globally. We 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 are hoping for an increase in in exports. We're hoping that economies around the world start to get back to some semblance of normal, so that demand returns to something like normal, because we really do need to move uh, substantial amounts of our agricultural products overseas. Uh, you look at a product like. Uh, like pork, for instance, poultry, uh, you know, something like 15 to as much as maybe 20 percent of, of pork production is 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 going to find a home overseas. And so uh, having a robust economy globally really helps with being able to move that product. And and I think you're right. If you look at our major commodities, production is going to be uh, pretty good this year. Uh, we've got some weather issues around the country here and there, but overall crop conditions look look really much better than average and so we are anticipating a big harvest uh, that uh, really in some parts of the the uh, the country is getting underway now so uh, this this issue of what will transpire with the global economy and what that means for exports is uh, a big open question for us right now certainly we're hoping for uh, enough of a recovery that exports return to something like normal uh, I want to go first to Tab Town. We've got a couple of minutes remaining, but I'll start with uh, with Tab Townsville because you, sir, as Mayor of Conway, you stood for election several times. It makes it, is it not, ex does it not make it exponentially more difficult to restore consumer confidence, uh, to, to under, underwrite the psychology of a recovery with the turmoil in Washington and particularly in a presidential election year, as volatile as this one seems? It's certainly, it's, it's not been, been helpful that, the, um, that there's a promise of delivery coming out of Washington, D.C. at any level, Congress um, or the presidency, uh, just because of the dis dysfunction that, that's a seemingly apparent uh, in our news today. So yes, it's a, it's extremely difficult to imagine a you know, for anybody to imagine a unified response to the pandemic coming out of our nation's uh, government at this time. Whereas we've seen a much more unified approach uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, so yes, it's hard to build the confidence levels needed to get us through this, to steal us, to get us ready, to give us the confidence that yes, if we just get through this storm there's better days coming, um, it's tough to build with the dysfunction that we see and hear about you know, on, a, on a regular basis in the news. Yeah, John Anderson. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, uh, we, we don't have a uh, effectively functioning political system right now, and uh, we certainly need one. Uh, Issues like a pandemic shouldn't be politicized, but uh, I think it's clear that in certain ways they have been, and that has hampered our response, and that uh, that limits our degrees of freedom to operate as we as we as we look at optimal strategies. And uh, Mervyn Jebaraj, we can't even agree, as Dr. Anderson pointed out, we can't even agree on whether masks are an appropriate response. I mean, if we want to ignore the politics of the situation, we can deal with this crisis in a way that's effective. You know, there's. Uh, we should uh, invoke the Defense Production Act to build more testing capacity for this country. We probably need a census level uh, hiring to deal with contact tracing to catch all the cases in an effective manner and quarantine them. And it's important to maintain the stimulus that we've provided during this pandemic. 
Uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about whether the $600 unemployment boost uh, led to people not going to work. There are definitely anecdotes of that, but when you look at the data, that's simply not borne out at all. People, you know, that got the unemployment benefits, about 70% of them returned to work when they were called back to work and made less money at work than they did on unemployment benefits. So people are not, you know, that is not proven to be the disincentive that people think it is. So provide the stimulus provide more testing capacity, and let's get a lot of contact tracers, and we can get ahead of this. Then, in other words, the data suggests there is no or not much malingering, to use the term. Mervyn? No. I mean, at some point when we're closer to a lower unemployment rate and a normal economy, sure, an unemployment uh, insurance boost that's this high uh, will have work disincentives, where right now the work is simply not there, and taking the money away just puts them out of their house and unable to feed their families. Gentlemen, we could go on if we had more time, but we don't, at least on this broadcast. But we know that we'll have you back on soon. Thanks to all of you for, for your contributions. And thanks to you for watching. We'll see you next week.